Thank you, Ann. We have to get all of our technology working today in this new atmosphere. There we go, now you can hear me. Thank you, Ann, for that children's message today. I wanted to start out today with a little quiz for all of you, but I need to read to you today's scripture lesson from 2 Timothy. If we hear these words that the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter. I'm giving you this commission in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is coming to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearance and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready to do it, whether it is convenient or inconvenient. Correct, confront, encourage with patience and instruction. There will come a time when people will not tolerate sound teaching. They will collect teachers who say to them what they want to hear because they are self-centered. They will turn their back on the truth and turn to myths. But you must keep control of yourself in all circumstances. Endure suffering. Do the work of a preacher of the good news and carry out your service fully. I'm already being poured out like a sacrifice to God and the time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight, finished the race, and kept the faith. At last the champion's wreath that is rewarded to the righteous is waiting for me. The Lord, who is the righteous judge, is going to give it to me on that day. He's giving it not only to me, but to all those who have set their heart on waiting for his appearance. Do your best to come to me quickly. Demas has fallen in love with the present world and has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Cretans have gone to Galatia. And Titus has gone to Domitia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you. He has been a big help to me in my ministry. I sent Titus to Ephesus. And when you come, bring along the coat that I left with Carpus in Troas. And also, bring the scrolls and especially the parchments. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, as I continue in this sermon series that I started a couple of weeks ago, we're focusing in on wisdom where wisdom is found. Wisdom is very important according to the scriptures. As you just heard there in 2 Timothy, People need wisdom in order to discern sound teaching and not to be carried away by false teachers in this world. People need wisdom in order to discern how to make good decisions in their everyday life. And so I have a quiz for us today to see how well we have taken in wisdom you don't need to study for this, so don't worry that you didn't know I was going to give you this quiz today, all right? I just want to see how many of these popular wisdom sayings you know. So I'm going to say the first part of them, and then I want you to tell me the second part of this wisdom saying. Just speak it out if you know it. And if you're watching at home, speak it out there too. Let's all take this quiz together. So are you guys ready? All right. Here's number one. God helps those who? That's right. Rules are made to be? Whoa, y'all really know that one. <laughs> Woo, got my hands filled here. You only go around? Yes. Different strokes for? No pain. No guts. Y'all did really, really well. Give yourselves a hand. That was great. Y'all know those sayings. 
Yeah. I was given that quiz in a seminary class one day, and all of us were able to answer those questions, those, finish those phrases, just like you did today. But then the professor said, let me give you some wisdom sayings from Scripture and see how well you do with these. So these wisdom sayings come from the Old Testament book of Proverbs that we've looked at each one of these weeks in this sermon on wisdom because the book of Proverbs is part of wisdom literature in the Old Testament. And Proverbs are just very vivid, short, memorable statements to remind us of how to live wise. Proverbs are everywhere. Those sayings that I just called out to you could be known as proverbs that we live by. You find proverbs on billboards, you find them on coffee mugs, you find them on cross stitch things hanging in people's rooms. But let's see if we know these proverbs from the Old Testament. The fear of the Lord is? Oh, y'all do know that one. Yay! Absolutely. That's from Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. What about this one? A wise person ignores? A wise person ignores an insult. A wise person ignores an insult. That's from Proverbs 12, 16. Whoever mocks the poor... Whoever mocks the poor insults his maker, God. That's from Proverbs 17, 5. It's not good to eat too much honey, nor is it glorious to... Seek one's own wisdom. Proverbs 25, 27. We were obviously more familiar with that first set of Proverbs than we were the second, right? And for me, sitting in that seminary class, that was a little bit embarrassing. Because here I was, someone who had grown up in the church. My parents had me baptized as an infant in the church. My parents made sure that I went to Sunday school. And if we missed Sunday school because we were out of town, my parents always told me it was okay to ask my Sunday school teacher for those little leaflets that we used to give out in Sunday school so that I could take those home and read the stories and the lessons and know what I had missed, just like we do when we're in school and we ask the teacher to give us our homework assignment so we don't get behind. I would ask my Sunday school teacher, what did you talk about last week so that I'm not behind? I went through confirmation class. I received a Bible when I went into the third grade that the church gave to me, and I poured over those stories. My mother taught me how to pray beside the bed at night. When we went out of town to visit my grandparents, they made sure we went to church together as a family. And here I was in seminary preparing to stand before congregations and deliver the good news of Jesus Christ, and yet I was more schooled in the secular wisdom than I was in the scriptural wisdom. Now you may be sitting there and saying, well, what's wrong with being schooled in the secular wisdom? It's wisdom, right? And there is something good in the wisdom that is secular. I mean, when we think about those Proverbs that I just shared with you today, in those Proverbs, we realize that while we are not saved by our good works, it's important that because we are followers of Jesus Christ, that we live by certain values. And those Proverbs remind us of what that good living is all about. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, I don't have to reject everything that's secular. I don't. 
You know, we sometimes put this dichotomy of the religious, the sacred, and the secular. But all creation is from God. And so I don't have to reject everything that is secular in the world. I think about Moses in the Old Testament. You remember Moses, right? Moses is the one who was a friend of God. He spoke to God. He climbed up on the mountain and heard God's voice and brought down the words of God in the Ten Commandments written on tablets for the people. Moses was the guy who had a direct connection with God and could come to the people and say, Thus says the Lord. I heard God's voice speaking, and this is what God is saying. But Moses was not a particularly wise leader. Did you realize that? I mean, Moses tried to do everything himself. Moses tried to lead the people himself. And when they were grumbling and complaining and taking up all of his time, he didn't know what to do. And his father-in-law, Jethro, who was a pagan priest, was wise in the ways of the world. And so his father-in-law, Jethro, came to him and said, Moses, you're wearing yourself out trying to do everything yourself. You can't listen to all the needs of the people and do all the work by yourself. You're going to need to learn something called delegation. You see, the ways of the world are not always bad. Consider these American proverbs. The early bird does what? Gets the worm. Or this phrase, bloom where you're planted. Or this phrase, when the going gets tough, the tough gets donuts. <laughs> Why is that funny? That's not the way it goes. <laughs> No, the tough get going. Those American proverbs do help us to live a godly life. They help me to remember that as a follower of Jesus, as one who has been adopted into the family of God, I need to be faithful in the way that I live and make the use of each day. For the scriptures do tell us to not tarry, but to make use of the resources and the time that God has given to us. God has given us this great resource of time. These Proverbs remind me that God is not limited to one method of speaking to us. Surely God speaks to us through the Holy Scriptures, and as United Methodist, we believe that we come to know God and God's will for our lives through something called the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. With Scripture as the very foundation of our faith, but we read and understand Scripture through the lenses of tradition, people who have gone before us and thought about things before us and wrestled with things before us, which is why we read the creeds when we gather together in worship to remember what people before us have learned and discerned about God's presence and God's will in this world. And we read the scriptures through the lens of reasoning because we believe that God gave us a brain to think about things. And as I said to you last week, a faith that, not, that cannot be questioned is a faith that is not strong enough to sustain you. God is not threatened by our questions. God gave us a brain to think through things. And when we read the scriptures and we have questions, that's okay. We're called to think through them and to pray through them. And we read the scriptures through the lens of experience. For our experience in life, our communal experience, and our individual experience of God's presence and the way that God works in the world informs us. God is not limited to one method of speaking to us. The proverb that we read today, Proverbs chapter 2, 
tells us that wisdom is a gift from God, but we cannot just claim that gift without effort. We have to do something in order to receive that gift of wisdom. Look back at that proverb, Proverb chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, and it says we need to cry out for insight. We need to seek it like silver. We need to hunt for it like a buried treasure. God's wisdom is all around. For all creation is from God. But the prerequisite of receiving that gift of wisdom is we have to have a receptive spirit willing to listen and to look for it, open to seeing it in our midst. And I believe the problem is we have difficulty listening, listening for God's voice in the world. Again, we divide the world into sacred and secular and we don't realize we can listen for God's voice in the secular. I believe a new day has dawned in the life of churches, and some churches are criticized for it, but there is popularity among many congregations to do sermon series about where to find God in movies. Where to find God in movies. I've done those sermon series myself, and if you read the biography that was written about my life that Fran put together in the connection when I first arrived here, you'll know that my husband and I enjoy watching movies. When I was at Lutheran Theological Seminary, I took a course on the theology in film. For as we look at these everyday life stories that are played out in movies, we can see glimpses of God's grace and God's love at work in the world. Now to be sure, it has been said that every work of art can speak God's divine message. Music touches our souls and lifts our spirits whether it's sacred music in the church or secular music that we might draw meaning from. I remember hearing Bette Midler's song, From a Distance, God is Watching Us. And I loved the melody of that song, From a Distance, God is Watching Us. But it was bad theology. For God is an added distance like a watchmaker who put us in motion, God is very near to our spirits. So I could listen to that, and I could listen to it with friends who don't attend worship, and we could talk about how we loved the song, and then it would open us up to a conversation about where is God in the midst of life. You see, if we listen for God's wisdom in the world, we will surely find it. We're told in the Holy Scriptures, if of all our heart we truly seek God, we will find God. And God is wisdom and will enlighten us in this world. But the problem is we really don't know how to listen, do we? I think we're very much in a world where miscommunications can happen so easily. And so I want you to think about this week how often you stop to listen for God's voice in the world. You know, it's very much like our cell phones. I had this habit that when I go into a meeting or when I'm going to visit somebody, I usually don't take my cell phone with me at all. And if I do take it, I turn the volume all the way down. Now, that may be good for the time that I'm visiting with people and the time that I'm in the meeting, and we're not disrupted by the phone, I can focus on the people who are in front of me. But here's where I have a problem. More often than not, 
I forget where I put the phone. And so I have actually had to drive back here to the church because I left it on my desk and forgot to take it home after a meeting. I will get home and my husband will say, why didn't you ever answer my call? And I'll say, oh, I didn't know you called me. And then I'll pull out my phone and I'll look at it and oh my goodness, I left it on silent and he called 15 times. <laughs> We're often like that with God. We have to open ourselves up to be receptive. We have to turn on the power supply to be able to hear God's voice speaking to us in this world in the myriad of ways God speaks to us, whether it's through books like Anne read to the children today, or whether it's through movies, or music, or works of art, we need to be open to seeing God's fingerprints all over this world and listening for what God is telling us, but to do so with a discerning mind that separates out what is in line with God's character, what is in line with other things that I've read in Scripture. Are the things that the world is telling me and that I'm seeing in these movies and reading in these books and hearing in this music, are they in line with who I know God to be and who God has called me to be? Listening with a discerning ear and being able to learn from people who differ from us. As I issue a challenge to each one of us, 30-day challenge to grow in wisdom. One of the things I want to challenge you with this week is to think about books that you have read, that you have loved, and ask yourself, why did you love them? What kind of wisdom did you receive from them? Because those things that we take in shape our character and shape our future. And then I want to encourage you to pick up books or to read blogs from people that you think you'll disagree with. And after you read that blog or that book or that article, I want you to try to find two or three positive things that were said by that person you disagree with. For none of us has the market on all of the wisdom that's out there. And in our world today, we have siloed ourselves so much that we're growing further and further apart. The Apostle Paul, who wrote those words in 2 Timothy, encourages us to be ones who are aware of who God is and who God has called us to be. And he asks that his books and his parchments be brought back to him while he's in prison. Now I find that very interesting. He asks for his coat because he's cold in this prison. But he asks for his books and his parchments. He wants to read. We don't know exactly what his books and his parchments were. Scholars believe that the parchments were the Old Testament scriptures, that he wanted to remind himself of God's wisdom in the Old Testament scriptures but remember, Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles, so surely some of those books that he had might have been popular works. That he understood the culture in which he lived. And he wanted to read those books and those parchments in his last days to remind himself of the wisdom of God. My friends, wisdom is a gift of God but we need to be open and receptive to receiving it. Dallas Willard is a great theologian, and Dallas Willard wrote some words that I want to share with you. He said in one of his books that God's wisdom is a free gift. It comes to us freely but it requires our effort. It requires 
our effort. One of the ways we can begin to open ourselves up and use that effort is to begin our day in prayer. Very first thing in the morning, asking God to open you up, just like my cell phone, to receive God's wisdom so that throughout the day, when God's wisdom is whispering through the culture around you, you will recognize it. May it be so for you and for me in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.